Good morning, everyone. My name is Talithia, and I serve in the choir and on the board of trustees here at Purpose Church. Whether you've been a part of our online community for a long time, or you're just freshly tuning in, I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us in worshiping our Lord. There's something at our church for everyone, at every age and every stage. So let us help you connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God by following our social media, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and checking out our website. Today we continue our study through the book of Ephesians, exploring how to survive in a world of information overload. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about what's happening at our church. The Church Center app is your one-stop shop for all things Purpose Church. It's the easiest way to stay connected to our community. You can get the latest church updates, register for events, and even give securely with just one tap. You can also join many of our learning groups like Financial Peace University or Marriage Enrichment Groups through the app. So download the Church Center app from your app store. Set Purpose Church as your home to get plugged into one of our many groups, like Rooted. Rooted is a transformative 10-week group experience designed to ground your faith deeply. Developed in Kenya, Rooted has impacted thousands of lives around the world, including over 2,000 people right here at Purpose Church alone. Starting Sunday, January 21st, Rooted groups will be held at 10 and 11.30 a.m. right here on campus. If you're ready to forge a lasting connection with God and other believers, register now at PurposeChurch.com groups or through the Church Center app. Men, the first monthly Warrior Breakfast of 2024 is coming up on January 20th. This gathering offers an opportunity for men of all ages to have intentional worship, meaningful fellowship, and to hear the word of God. There's no cost to join and no sign up is necessary. Simply show up and be ready to enjoy a great time and great food. Feel free to bring a friend along as we join together for a morning of connection and inspiration. There are many other ways that you can partner with Purpose Church to further God's kingdom. To find these opportunities or to give online, go to purposechurch.com give. Now let's pray together as we continue to worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for guiding us safely into this new year, Lord. We pray for your wisdom and your revelation as we go into this new week, Lord. And we pray that you would just anoint the sermon and allow it to just rest on us and envelop us and allow us to use it so that we can draw closer to you throughout this week. Lord, we lift your name up and we worship you today and every day. And we're just so thankful that you've called us your own. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
declaring who Jesus is and how he always comes through for us. We praise you, God. Listen here. I praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater. Sing with me, come on. I praise cause you're sovereign. You praise reign. cause you reign. like every day, we are battling an avalanche of information filled with global tragedies, advertisements, and social commentaries. Hearing God's voice and finding meaning in His Word seems daunting, impossible even. But despite the noisiness of the world, there is hope. Through His Word, through music, through community, our God consistently demonstrates that His voice is wise, His voice is reliable. His voice is revelatory, and His voice deserves our attention. When we listen for Him, we'll discover that Jesus' name has the power to break every chain that shackles us. Through each aspect of our lives, God proves to us that He is immeasurably more. Well, hey there, Purpose Church Online. My name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here. And we believe that God loves you and we love you also. And so wherever you're joining us from, we would love to connect with you. And we're so excited that you are joining us today. Let's open our Bibles together to the book of Ephesians as we're in week two of our series, Immeasurably More, where we're going verse by verse through the entire book of Ephesians in the New Testament. But before we get too much farther into that, Purpose Church, I am so excited to introduce you to our brand new young adults pastor, Pastor Marcus. We are so honored and excited for him and his family to be joining our ministry. And I wanted you to hear from Pastor Marcus about his story with Purpose Church and why he's excited about leading our young adults ministry. So let's hear from Pastor Marcus. Everyone, everywhere following Jesus. What an amazing vision. So um, for me, that, that vision started a long time ago when I was about 16, when the Lord touched me and the woman prayed for me and, and I decided that I wanted to commit my entire life um, to, to making disciples of people from all nations. But my experience here at Purpose Church started way back in 1983, if you can believe that. In 1983, um, before this building was even built, uh, I was a little kid about this tall, and um, Purpose Church, First Baptist Church Pomona, was my home church at that time. And um, this church spent so much time cultivating Jesus in me, um, cultivating a desire for me to go out and to do missions and to, to go into Christian education, um, to teach people everything that Jesus has taught us. So um, 
from 1983 until 1999, this was my home church. And then since then, I, I had a chance to, to actually be a missionary in Taiwan. Um, I spent some time pastoring some Chinese immigrant churches, spent some time in Christian higher education, and, and I found my way back here, um, a place that I call home. And, and it's, it's totally amazing to see all of you here. It's, it's exciting to, to be able to invest in and to help some of these young adults grow in their faith and to fall more and more with the Jesus that I fell in love with. That's so powerful, Pastor Marcus. Well, I just want to take a minute just to pray for you and to pray for your family, your wife Kay and your sons Justice and Micah and, and just our young adults here at Purpose Church. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for calling Marcus here so many years ago and then calling him back here, him and his family. Uh, we just thank you so much for Kay and for Justice and Micah. And we just thank you because we know the best days of ministry for our young adults is ahead of us. And so God, I pray that you would bless him, that you would use him and that God, you would do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine in his life and in the young adults here at Purpose Church. Jesus, we give you thanks for Pastor Marcus. In your name we pray, amen. 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 Thanks so much, brother. Well, let's look at our series. Let's look at this topic of how to survive in a world of information Overload. That's a little bit what we're going to be talking about today. But while you're maybe still flipping to the book of Ephesians, I want you to remember that this letter was written by Paul, who was a brilliant first century man who made it his life's mission to bury the message of Jesus and to bury the church until he met Jesus. And his story is similar to mine, similar to many of our stories, and maybe even some similar to yours or one day will be similar to yours. When Jesus Christ made the difference in his life, he gave his life to Christ and everything changed. In fact, he went from burying the church and burying the message of Jesus to building his life on the message of Jesus and building diverse churches of Jews and Gentiles who had nothing in common except their salvation in Christ. And that was enough. You know, this last Sunday, Pastor Glenn did an amazing job talking about how this small band of Christians who had no political power and who, who were standing up for Christ in a culture that was dramatically different from their own and very much against them. And yet God used them to actually change the world. Now, Dr. Derwin L. Gray uh, gives us some insight into the culture of Ephesus. He writes, Ephesus, a population of over 300,000 people, was a booming, ethnically diverse port city in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. It was also the capital of the province of Asia, which was a Roman city at the time. Ephesus would be comparable to any large city in America. As we learn in Acts 19, Paul went to Ephesus on his second missionary journey and spent three years there establishing congregations. While Paul was imprisoned around AD 60, he wrote this beautiful letter to the young congregations that he planted in Ephesus. Ephesus. And last Sunday, if you missed Pastor Glenn's sermon, you got to go back. He did a phenomenal job unpacking the first few verses of Ephesians and really the context and the culture that Paul was writing to. He, Pastor Glenn talked about Hellenism, that, that ancient Greek idea of uh, uh, obsession with self and how rampant that was in the first century and how eerily similar that is to even the culture that we experience today. You know, one, one of the big ideas that we were recapping last Sunday was that the gods, the false gods that the people in Ephesus were worshiping, they didn't love the people and, and they demanded self-mutilation and they demanded child sacrifice. And, and it, it was a horrible setting that that they were in, that, that the church in Ephesians found themselves in the culture they were in. 
And yet the true God, the one true God, Jesus Christ was a radically different message. It was a message of God loving people in Christ so much so that Jesus laid down his life. He died on the cross and rose from the dead to forgive us of our sins, to reunite us with God. And Jesus doesn't expect his followers to mutilate themselves or to sacrifice their children, but to trust him and to obey him. You see, as Paul's writing into this context, in Ephesians chapter one and two, he actually describes in 27 different ways, truths and and new ways of understanding who we are in Christ. In other words, he says, here's 27 descriptions of the fruit that comes from having your life transformed by Jesus. And I wanted to just show you, here are the 27 that Paul lists between Ephesians one and two. And the interesting thing to me is that all of us are looking for these, that, that we're looking to be chosen. We're, we're looking to be adopted and forgiven and, and loved and called and, and we wanna be brought near. We wanna have peace. All the things that we're looking for are actually available to us in Christ because Paul understands the context he's writing to. They need to know this and it turns out we do as well. Now, before we get into our passage today, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, I have a question I want to ask you, and it's this When was the last time that you felt overwhelmed? When was the last time you felt completely in over your head? You you know, for me, it oftentimes happens when something breaks at our house. Like anytime there's there's a maintenance issue, whether it's in our car or in our house, I just get overwhelmed. I, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. I end up making things worse when I try to fix it. In fact, at the risk of like turning in my man card, I just gotta be honest with you, my wife, Sarah, she repairs most of the stuff in our house because I, I just, I don't, I don't get how to do that stuff. And so whenever there's an issue, you with our home, it really causes me anxiety and I feel overwhelmed. In fact, a couple years ago, you know, one of my jobs at our house is, is to take out the trash at night. And actually our oldest kids now, they actually do that job. And it's pretty awesome. Like our kids are getting at that stage where they can take on big projects at the house. And I'm just saying this whole parenting thing's paying off. I mean, it's, it's working. It's working in our advantage. But you know, a couple years ago when they couldn't do that, my job was always to take the trash out at night to the driveway on, on Tuesday nights. And one night I got home really late from work and I went over to the trash cans to take them out to the driveway. And as I was walking, all of a sudden I felt this furry thing crawl over my hand and I jumped back. I freaked out. I didn't know what it was. Maybe I thought it was a broom or something. So, so I kicked the trash can and all of a sudden this rat, this big old rat popped his head up out of the trash can and he looked at me and, and I can't prove it, but I swear he said, I'm going to kill you. Like it freaked me out. I mean, I know he didn't say that, but I was just so freaked out about this rat. And I, I ran upstairs. I woke my wife up and, and I put her hand over my heart and my chest was beating so fast. And she was like, Eric, is your heart beating for me? Cause you love me. And I said, I almost died for you. Like that rat almost took me out. And I told her the whole story. And, and the next week, the same thing happened again with that rat. And I remember literally telling Sarah, we may have to move. Like this, this rat's gonna take over our house. Like, I don't know what to do. We may have to move. Or, or maybe the last time you felt overwhelmed was when that doctor or that nurse handed you that child for the first time and and said, okay, you can go home. Maybe it was a child that you were adopting. Maybe it was a child you were receiving from the foster care system, or maybe your own biological child. And and you thought to yourself, "Uh, do they know something? I don't know. I I don't know if I'm qualified to take care of this child. Maybe it's a class that you're failing right now in school and, and you just feel so overwhelmed and you can't get out from under it. Maybe it's a disaster going on in our world. Maybe it's as you walk the hallways of your workplace or of your school, you feel like you have no friends and, and you feel some anxiety about that. Maybe the last time you felt overwhelmed is when you buried a loved one that all of a sudden life is moving slow and you can't seem to get out from under it. Maybe it was that bad diagnosis that you just received, that everything was going great until that doctor's appointment and and you're left just feeling overwhelmed, completely in over your head. 
You see, I want to ask a question. How, how do we face those completely overwhelming moments of life? Or, or how do we face it when we have information overload? Or in other words, this question, how do we survive in a world of information overload? And you see, this is exactly what I think Paul is going to help us with today in Ephesians chapter one. Because the first big idea, the first thing you need to make a commitment on is this, that, that if you're gonna survive a world of information overload, you've got to value wisdom and revelation over excessive information. You've got to value wisdom and revelation over excessive information. Find me in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. You see, Paul has a very specific prayer that he is praying for these followers of Jesus in Ephesus. And he is calling on the triune God. He is calling on Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to give them wisdom and Revelation. Now, now let's define those terms real quick. Wisdom is living according to God's ways over the world's ways. Revelation comes from knowing God's word over the world's words. Now, maybe you're sensing, I, I know a lot of the world's words. I know a lot of the world's ways. Uh, that's just going to get you more information and, and more discouraged. The goal of wisdom is to choose God's ways over the world's ways. And revelation comes to us through God's words over the world's words. Now, for many of us, we are overly aware of everything that is happening in the world. I mean, we are so connected, like never before has any generation been as connected to what is happening worldwide as we are. In fact, you can Google anything and get an answer to almost any question. In fact, I had a friend who was uh, training to be a doctor. He was in a residency program and uh, a patient came into an ER that he was working in who had a, a, a burn on their hand, a pretty significant burn and, and their hand actually needed to be stitched back together. The skin needed to be stitched back together. Well, my doctor friend had kind of forgotten how to do that. And so he actually YouTubed how to repair a skin burn and how to sew it back together. And he told me he actually put the phone up in such a way that the patient couldn't see. He clicked play and he sewed the guy's hand back together via the instructional video on YouTube. I mean, you can find out just about anything. You see, in 2024, people are not trying to figure out how to get information. People are desperately looking for insight and meaning. Or in Paul's words, wisdom and revelation. Now, maybe you don't buy it yet or you don't believe me. I would just ask you to think about the, the news program that you like to listen to, the news station that you watch, your, your favorite news program. And if you're honest as you're evaluating it, I want to ask you this question. What percentage of what they're reporting to you is purely facts? And then what percentage of what they're reporting to you are their insights or, or their ideas or, or their interpretation of the events? And if you're watching news recently as it has evolved, there is very, there are smaller and smaller amounts of percentage of actual facts and more and more a higher percentage of interpretation of those facts. You see, the question really is, where do you and I go in our search for meaning and insight? Or where do we go for wisdom and revelation? I think part of the problem for us as the human race is we look to each other too much. That, that we're like sheep walking around talking with other sheep trying to make sense. And the reality is we need a shepherd. It's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 verse 36, he said, or it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
Wisdom and revelation require that you and I submit ourselves to a shepherd, to someone who could lead us because on our own, we can't come up with our own insight and meaning. It kind of reminds me, or maybe we could spend a moment analyzing sort of our social media use as a case study or, or the news that you watch. You know, this past week, I was with our high school students here at Purpose Church, which by the way, if you've got a child or a student, I want to encourage you, get them involved in our kids programming on Wednesdays and Sundays and our student programming on Wednesdays and Sundays. There are some amazing things happening in those ministries. And I was with our high school ministry this past Wednesday and, and the whole focus of the night was how do we see social media from a biblical perspective? And there was a Q&A portion at the end that they invited me to be a part of. And, and one of the challenges I gave our students that I would actually extend to you is to consider taking an entire day and not using social media or not watching the news. But every time you have an urge to go to social media or to watch new, the news program that you like, to, to not do it, to resist it, but to write it down in your phone, to, to like log it on a piece of paper and ask yourself this question, why am I feeling the need to go to social media right now? Or why am I feeling the need to click on the news? Now I took a whole day and I took this challenge as well and it was shocking, like painfully shocking for me because I realized I tried to go to social media way more than I thought throughout the day. And usually it's because I'm trying to avoid a negative emotion. It's because I'm bored in a moment. And instead of going to God or fostering a deeper relationship with someone, I, I will settle for this distraction. You see, I have all the access in the world, but what I actually need is God's wisdom and revelation to analyze my habits, to analyze my rhythms. Am I truly living God's ways or am I living out the world's ways? Now let's go back to Paul as, as Paul is trying to help us learn how to survive in a world of information overload. It, it seems like we need to have an ongoing connection with Jesus. One that centers us. One that, 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 that keeps us grounded. And this idea of wisdom and revelation, it doesn't only show up here in Ephesians. In fact, it's all over the place in the Bible. In the Old Testament, in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. You see, Solomon is saying, where there is no revelation, you will live an anchorless life. And where there is no wisdom, you will live a purposeless life. You see, we all need wisdom and revelation. Uh, let, me, let me give you an analogy. And at the risk of you making fun of me, I, I'm just gonna share it. it. It's a pickleball analogy. And I know all of you are like, Eric, pickleball. We know you love it. We get it. Here's the problem. Somebody at our church, they just recently uh, got me this shirt, this very sweet couple that says, I love Jesus and pickleball. I can't help it. I, I'm just seeing God all over the place and pickleball is no exception. When I first started playing pickleball, you guys can take that picture off the screen, but as, as, as I was beginning to play pickleball, I remember feeling like the best strategy is to hit the ball as hard as I possibly can. The problem is if you do that, you are going to wear yourself out. I mean, you're going to have no energy to last through the game, but that's just what made sense to me. And one morning I was playing pickleball with some strangers at this park and, and sort of the godfather of pickleball at this park is this guy named Kevin. He literally pulled me aside, pulled me off the court and said, Eric, let's run some drills together. And I mean, I felt like LeBron was literally giving me some, some lessons in pickleball. And the thing about our conversation is the first thing Kevin did is he gave me some revelation. He said, you need to know, here's how the game works. You don't need to hit it hard every single shot, that it's actually more about placement. And then he gave me wisdom by running drills with me. We were literally hitting the ball back and forth, practicing, and he has had a profound impact on my game. 
You see, to survive in a world of information overload, you need to have humility, to listen to a voice that's louder than your own. But Paul's not done with us yet. In fact, he's gonna begin to articulate why wisdom and revelation are absolutely necessary for us. You see, wisdom and revelation from God will fill you with hope and strength while information alone can only fill you with fear and despair. It's why if you're gonna survive in a world of information overload, number two, you've got to rest in God's hope and strength. Ephesians 1, 18 to 20. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Jesus wants to give you hope that God is working in your life even when it's hard to see that. You see, in, in your heart, your, either your problems will be bigger than your God or your God will be bigger than your problems. The first mindset will lead to paralysis and the second mindset will lead to peace. If when you think about the problems of your life, they are so much bigger than your God, the only thing you can expect is to feel paralyzed. But God wants to give us hope and strength rooted in him. And what that will do is that will start to increase your view of God and decrease the reality of your problems so much so that you can have and know his Peace. Uh, a, few, um, uh, a few years ago, I made this decision that I wanted to kind of write a, a commentary of the Bible to, to give to my kids one day. And so I made a decision that with every chapter of the Bible that I read, I, I have to at least write one note, one commentary, one idea from every single chapter in the Bible. And so I've been doing this for a while now where as I'm reading and it's, it's requiring me to read the Bible a little slower, but I, I'm making these notes and, and I feel like I'm getting so much out of it. And, and I, I had been going through this season a while ago where I was just feeling really discouraged. And I was reading the Old Testament and I just said, God, I need something from the New Testament. And, and don't get me wrong, you can get massively encouraged from the Old Testament. I had just been in it for a while and I just felt like I needed some New Testament encouragement. And so I went to my Google Doc where I keep all of these notes of, of you know, what God's teaching me through every chapter of the Bible. And I, I went to look for a book of the Bible where I didn't have all those notes, a book in the New Testament. And I got to 2 Corinthians and, and I actually had a note for every single chapter in 2 Corinthians except chapter 4 and chapter 10, which was really weird. I said, I, don't, I wonder why that was. And so I just said, okay, Lord, I don't know if this is you, but I'll, I'll read chapter 4 and chapter 10. And friends, God massively encouraged me through chapter four. It was just so, that first verse, it was just so encouraging. And then I got to chapter 10. And in chapter 10, Paul talks about taking every thought captive to Christ. And, and, and it reminded me that, you know, the reality is either your thoughts will take you captive or you will hand all of your thoughts over to Christ and let him take those thoughts captive. And when he does, that gives you hope and strength. Jeannie Stevens has this interesting line where she says, a thought can't hurt you until you start believing all your thoughts are true. But not only does God want to give you hope that he's working in your life, even when you can't see it, but Jesus wants to give you strength through the power of the resurrection. 
Remember in Paul's day in the, in, the, in the first century, they thought power would come if they mutilated their bodies in worship of these false gods. But here Paul is saying to this group of Christians and to anybody interested in the message of Jesus that there is a power that rose Jesus from the dead that is available to you and it's available to me. And that when we understand that we have God with us and that the same God who rose Jesus from the dead can give power to our lives, oh, it's a total game changer. It reminds me of Psalm chapter 18, where David says, you, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. Friends, on your own, you probably can't scale that wall. On your own, you can't advance against the the, the troops in front of you. But with God, all things are possible. With God, he, he wants, by the power of the resurrection, he wants to give you power, his power and his presence to face whatever that wall is that health diagnosis, that broken relationship, that problem at work, that division in your family, whatever it may be, that wall that seems impossible to scale with God, you can scale it. And and friends, here's why it's so important that Jesus is always our starting point, that he's always our center, that he's our finish line. Here's why you and I can have confidence when the world or our world is spinning out of control is because of who Jesus is. And here Paul paints a big picture of who Jesus is. He's not just your homie. He's not just your friend. This is who Jesus is. Find me again back in verse 19. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Whoo! Did did you hear that? Paul says, this is, you got to know this. Jesus is alive. How can you have the hope and strength? How can you rest in that? Paul says, Jesus is alive. Jesus is in heaven. Jesus is in control and Jesus is our leader. In Hebrews chapter four, the the author of Hebrews, he writes this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Now check out this next verse. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. In fact, I want you to say that word with me at home or wherever you're listening right now as you're driving or working out or whatever you're doing, even if you're with people, all of you together, I want you to say confidence with me on the count of three. One, two, three, confidence. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Friends, Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we have been, the Bible says. He experienced rejection and loss. He felt what it was like to to be misunderstood, and yet he didn't sin. But here's the most profound truth of scripture, is that even though Jesus didn't sin, and we have sinned, He does not run away from us, but he runs towards us. You see, Satan wants your past to keep you from running to Jesus. But Jesus left heaven, died on the cross, rose from the dead so that you could have confidence in his love for you and you could run to him. Satan wants you to feel like a loser. 
You know why? Because he's the biggest loser. That sucker's a loser and he wants you to feel like a loser. But if you are in a relationship with Jesus, no matter what difficulties you're facing, no matter how overwhelming the amount of information or circumstances you're going through right now are, you are not a loser. You are a winner because you are on team Jesus and his is the winning team. He has won the victory. Now, maybe, maybe at this point you're going, okay, but Eric, isn't all of this just like theory or like Bible jargon talking about Jesus? Like, is, is this real? I just want to share one last story with you. One example of how powerful Jesus is. A woman in our church shared her story with me and she gave me permission to to reshare it. For confidentiality purposes, I'll give her the name Jessica. Jessica grew up in Los Angeles and when she was a little girl, her mom and dad got divorced and her mom eventually remarried. This man that she remarried was an alcoholic And while her mom was gone a lot and so were her other siblings, there was a lot of time where Jessica was alone with her new stepdad. When Jessica was 10 years old, her stepdad began abusing her. And he made sure that she would never feel safe telling anyone about what he was doing to her. For the next four years, from the ages of 10 to 14, this man abused her at least once or twice every single week. Jessica told me she remembers wishing that she was a boy so that maybe he would stop abusing her. She lived in absolute terror of him And she finally escaped the home at the age of 14 and she found herself in a girl's group home. When she joined this girl's group home that very first night, those girls abused her in the same ways that her stepdad had abused her. Well, finally, when she was 18 years old, she moved out and shortly after getting her own apartment, she spiraled. She was overcome by trauma and the abuse and the struggles of her life. And so she decided that her only option was to end her life. Well, as Jessica was sitting beside her bed and as she was about to end her life, literally moments before she was gonna end her life, she heard a voice from her radio say, don't do it. Well, for some reason, Jessica enjoyed listening to Christian radio because the songs were really soothing. But on this particular day, it wasn't Christian music playing, but it was a sermon from a pastor. Well, she just figured to herself, this was just a coincidence. And so one more time, as she was preparing to end her life, she heard the voice from the radio say, don't do it. She kept listening to the message and the preacher invited the listeners to give their lives to Jesus and to receive his love and forgiveness. That day, Jessica decided to start following Christ and he began changing her life. The preacher also told the listeners who had received Christ to go tell someone about their decision. Well, Jessica shared what she had decided to put her faith in Christ with a friend who wasn't a Christian and the friend responded, I know a Christian who goes to church. Do you want me to introduce you to her? Jessica agreed and the Christian woman she was introduced to was a woman named Debbie. Now here's the craziest part. Debbie had only lived in Los Angeles for about six months. She previously lived in Pennsylvania, but earlier that year, God told Debbie to move to California because there was a woman who really needed her help and someone to disciple her. Of course, the woman that God was preparing Debbie to disciple was in fact, Jessica. And Debbie helped Jessica for several years as she got the healing she needed. And she began following Jesus even closer. 
Jessica told me as she reflects on her whole life that she can clearly see now all the ways God was taking care of her, watching over her and helping her every step of the way. Friends, how, how do we survive in a world of information overload? We, we seek God's wisdom and revelation. And, and when we do that, we begin to value wisdom and revelation over excessive information. We, we choose to rest in God's hope and strength. And thirdly, we believe there is power in the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter four, verse 12 Salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Paul said in our text at the end of Ephesians 1 that, that Jesus is the name above all other names. Friends, today you need to know this. There, in, there is power in the name of Jesus. Over the guilt that is consuming you, there is power in the name of Jesus. Over the worst case scenarios you replay in your head, there is power in the name of Jesus. Over the defeat that you feel being unemployed, there is power in the name of Jesus. Over the child that has run away from God and run away from you, there is power in the name of Jesus. Over the marriage that feels hopeless, there is power in the name of Jesus. Over the diagnosis that feels like a death sentence, there is power in the name of Jesus. Friends, you need to know this. We as a church are committed to this message and you need to know this today, no matter what you're going through, there is power in the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tina and I'm the worship producer here at Purpose Church. Remember to follow our social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and check out our website so that you can stay connected to everything happening at our church. See you next week.